Um, so, yeah, we've had, we, this is we're a continuation of our series on overcoming obstacles, and today we're talking about overcoming fear. And so, that's an interesting one because it's like even just standing up here. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there um, here and in our home audience that would be sort of petrified about the idea of just standing up in front of an audience and, and talking about things that you don't normally talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, or at least not in front of other people. And, it, and so I've been thinking about that, and it's like, well, here I've been given an opportunity to, you know, face a fear and maybe get a little braver and at the same time serve God. It's like, why wouldn't I want to do that? It's like, you should want to do that. And so I'm going to give you kind of uh, what I've been thinking about over the last couple of months, because I've had a couple of months to think about this and kind of stew over it and try to decide what I think I, people ought to know about what I think about fear. I mean, we've had some awesome lessons. We, you know, hey, Nathan's got his whole series on, on fear that we've been uh, enjoying it on Sunday mornings, and Ken talked about it a few weeks ago, and I enjoyed that. So, you know, what do I have to offer here? I mean, I, I don't intend to supplant anything that they said, but other than just to add, maybe add some color um, from somebody else, um, and someone else that's also going through the same uh, crazy human experience, and, you know, trying to understand, you know, why God made us such scared little creatures, and, you know, what it is we're supposed to do about that, and are we supposed to be brave, or are we just supposed to, you know, not worry about things and just be calm, or what exactly does he want from us <clears throat> on this? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a quick prayer for, for myself <laughs> here for a second. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us here together to learn more about you. Um, we are such scared little creatures, and you, you made us this way uh, at the same time you uh, comfort us when, when we need it, and so it's, it's, it's my desire to try to learn a little bit more about why we are the way we are and what it is we're supposed to do about it. Uh, it's in your holiest name I pray, amen. So to start with, does anybody remember this logo? I guess if you're any Gen Xers out there, you know this logo because when we were kids, this got stamped on everything. It got stamped on clothing, and maybe you had it on a hat, um, or maybe you, you saw it on a bumper sticker, uh, or maybe it was if you were a skateboarder, it was on the back of your skateboard. And I remember I was a rollerblader and back, back in the early 90s is like when they invented rollerblades. So I had some of the very first pair and I stamped my little no fear sticker on there as well. And so, you know, I was the guy you probably were annoyed with, you know, all over the neighborhood. In fact, you know, what I just saw before you guys got here, I was here early and some skateboarder just went right through the church, <laughs> right past through, through and on down into the parking lot. That was, that was me back then. And um, I got kicked off a few golf courses along the way. We were always places we shouldn't have been. There was something really fun about that. I don't know why. But I'm kind of proud of the Gen Xers and the fact that we kind of espoused this, this uh, the idea of no fear. I mean, you know, we did it. We liked it because we thought it was cool. But we had no idea that it was biblical. I mean, it turns out there's like 80 times in the Bible where we're directed to not be afraid or to have no fear. And there's 350 times in the Bible where there's just references to worries and anxieties and fears. So it's like you don't have to look, look through the Bible far to find something in the, something in the Scripture uh, related to fear. So it's a pretty hot topic. And, you know, as I was looking through uh, and reading a lot of Scripture, I came across the one that I thought was my favorite. So this is the one I put up first. I put, this is from 2 Corinthians. It says, there's no place in the kingdom of God for the fearful. We're locked in the heat of the battle with the wicked. And in this battle, we'll be called upon to stand, to fight, to endure, and to conquer. So I really liked that. And I sat and I stewed about that for a couple weeks. And I, and I was thinking to myself, so I'm not supposed to be fearful at all. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I'm supposed to be super brave? Is that what God means? Is that what he wants me to do? Or is he, is he saying that there's other times when I'm just going to have to um, sit back and... Um, Give it over to him. I mean, which is it? Which am I supposed to be? So I've been thinking about that. So I was thinking about um, this idea that or it's supposed to be brave or don't worry, be happy. It's going to be it's one of these two things. And so I, I, I want to kind of go into this idea of bravery. It's like, you know, bravery, having or showing mental or moral strength to face danger, fear, or difficulty. It's like, yeah, I like the idea of bravery. Joshua says, have I not com commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
I'm going to stop for a minute and talk about dragons. <laughs> I don't know why I've, I, I've always been kind of interested in dragons because it's like they're mythical. They don't exist, but we all know about them. Like, why? Why do we all know about them? I mean, it doesn't matter. You can grow, you can go to the other side of the planet, and, and, and everywhere in every culture, they have some idea of dragons or some mythical creature like a dragon. And so, and you'd, you'd say to me, well, you know, Kyle, that, that's, these are just silly stories. It's like, really? <clears throat> they're really old, really old stories. And uh, if they're so silly, how come people spend thousands of hours, talented people, you know, drawing pictures and paintings of them. You can go on the internet, there's millions of pictures of dragons that people spent time drawing. And, you know, this here on the right is a sculpture that sits in Berlin of St. George uh, slaying a dragon. So it's like, why would people go to all the effort to, I don't know, pass down such stories if it wasn't something that maybe you ought to at least pay attention to for a second? So I'm going to kind of think about this. So, like, what is it about dragons? It's like, well... They're scary. Okay, well, why are they scary? It's like, well, it's kind of like a lion. You know, it has like paws like a lion, and it's got teeth and mouth like a lion, but it's got the body of a serpent. You know, we're kind of supposed to be scared of that, and it's got wings. So it's like this lion, snake, bird, scary thing that breathes fire. It's like, yeah, I mean, that sounds like something as a human being that we ought to be afraid of. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like just fear, but it's like fear times ten. It's like a meta fear. And so... And what are the, the dragons always sitting on top of? But gold, right? So they're, they're hoarding gold. And so, you know, what would happen would be, of course, the, the, the story we know is like the, the knight, the brave knight, faces what he fears the most, faces the dragon and slays it. And in doing so, he gets the gold and he, you know, he saves the fair maiden. It's like, yeah, man, you know, face your fears. Slay them and you win everything. It's like, a, it's, there's a deep moral ethic in that that's lasted a long time, and there's something that's really important about bravery. <clears throat> so I, I stole this picture off the internet, but it does, definitely does kind of remind me of myself and my friends from back in the day. It's kind of like a 70s picture with, you can see that little bicycle with a banana seat, like I had one of those. And, you know, me and my friends used to ride our bikes up and down the street, and we would make those kind of homemade uh, ramps and drive up and go up, up the ramps. And I remember, you know, the first couple of times you did that was pretty scary, you know, uh, especially when you were the little guy. You, I mean, your older friends and stuff were jumping at you, so you'd be a little bit afraid. But there's something that's kind of cool about kids because they'll do that. It's like kids will, uh, in, in order to have uh, an adventure, they're willing to stand in the face of fear to do so. It's something that kids are really, really cool about doing that sometimes adults aren't so good at. And it's almost like as, as you know, when we're, when we're, when we're little kids, when you're born, I mean, what are you really afraid of? It's like, but as you grow up, there's thousands of things that you're afraid of, and then you accumulate those over years. It's like, that's, we, seems like we become more fearful instead of less. I, in fact, I had this, arg this sort of discussion with my wife last night. She's like, well, I think we become less fearful as we get older, and we bec become more knowledgeable. And I thought, well, I don't know about that. I, I feel like the world's always a scary place. There's always things to be afraid of, but I think that we become braver. There's something about that. It's, it's not that we become less scared, we become more brave. And so maybe you see kids like this, and they're standing up on, you know, precariously placed objects, and you may scream at your kid or your grandkid, like, get off of there. You know, or maybe you're one that's like, yeah, I'll let you go for a little while, but be careful, I'm watching. It's like, kids like to do this, and we like to let them do this, because it's like, what are you going to do? Have them sitting next to you on your side all the time? You, you want to let them explore and kind of face their fears and and get kind of an idea of the world. It's like there's something that's okay about that. So here's a picture of a skateboarder again. I'm on this trip. I don't know why. So here's a, a, a skateboarder that's doing tricks. And you might say to yourself, well, it, 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 that's stupid. I mean, is this stupid or is this courageous? I mean, it's, it's one or the other. Or maybe, I don't know, there's kind of a fine line between stupid and courageous. And I've been thinking about this guy, and it's like, well, that's pretty stupid, right? So, I mean, he's about eight feet in the air, and then when he falls, he can certainly, you know, break bones and uh, abrade his skin and get a concussion and all sorts of things, maybe even worse. And so it's like, why do these guys do that? I mean, that, does that make much sense? And is there anything that's sort of courageous about it? And part of me thinks that there's something 
that's, that's kind of noble and courageous about this. Because you can ask these guys, you can ask these skateboarders why they do it. And it's like, well, you know, they, they love the thrill of it, and they're sort of conquering their fears and such. But, and, you can, and you can tell them, look, we'll give you some protective gear. How about you wear a helmet and pads and such? And, and they'll refuse it. They'll refuse it because there's something about leaping in the air and being in the moment and being fully committed. So there's this idea that uh, of nobility and, and sort of jumping without a safety net and being fully committed and living in the moment. So I kind of like that. You know, uh, there was a, uh, there's a Dutch philosopher named Kierkegaard, and he had this kind of cool idea. He said, look, you know, we live in this world that's, um, you know, the historical, scientific, empirical sort of earth that we live in the world. <laughs> and then there's God, and is, is there a way to, to have a bridge between them? Is there such thing as a bridge between them? And his idea was that there really wasn't a, was not a bridge between them, but that what a Christian would do was make a leap, that there was this sort of leap of faith that you probably, uh, you've probably heard of people talking about a leap of faith. Well, that's kind of from Kierkegaard. His, his whole idea was that if, if you're really living this, uh, really living the Christian life, that what you're doing is that you're sort of suspended in air, and, and you're sort of suspended in midair, um, and you have, you're in a place where you've resigned control. It's like, I'm not in control. I'm living in the moment, and um, I've given the control over to God. So that's sort of the idea of Kierkegaard. So I kind of like the idea of skateboarding. It's like, hey, man, that kind of reminds me of your Christian walk. It's sort of like this leap where you're fully committed. You're all in. There's some games in life you don't get to play unless you're all in, and this is one of them. You know, I can teach you about fear. You know, I, I studied the human body for a long time. And back when I was a, in my early 20s, I taught biochemistry to undergraduates. And I really liked biochemistry. And one, one of the things you learn when you're studying the sort of the chemistry of cells and such is that cells have all this complex machinery that's uh, useful for making energy. And all those little chemical reactions that occur inside of a cell that's trying to make energy is very much influenced by hormones that come around it. And a lot of those hormones come from states about, of fear. So isn't that kind of interesting? So like even from the most basic cellular level, we are designed to deal with and respond to fear. It's, it's at the core. And you know, even this little guy here, cute little lizard, but when he gets scared, it's like he makes himself big and scary. It's, it's automatic and it's fast. And it's this whole idea of fight or flight. You know, we can talk about that. It's the idea that if you're in a scary situation that you're going to want to do one, one of two things. You're going to stand up and fight, or you're going to run and tuck tail and, and, and leave as fast as possible. And these circuits that control this kind of thing are super fast. I mean, there's a, an organ in the, in the base of your brain called the hypothalamus, and it's, it's an important part of the brain because it's, it's, very, it's very primitive, and it controls things like your need to sleep, um, you know, the need to, you know, eat when you're hungry, the need to breathe, the need to drink when you're thirsty. I mean, extraordinarily powerful center of the brain, and fear's right in there. These fear circuits are built right in there. And so, you know, when you're in a fearful state, it's very, very fast, and it's involuntary. It's involuntary. You know, you see something scary, your pupils dilate, and your, your muscles, uh, you know, get more blood flow, and your heart rate goes up, and it's like you're getting primed, and you're ready for action. So you get really effective at, at, at revving up. But there's actually some hard, there's some bad effects from fear. Too. It's like those same, that same part of the brain, the hypothalamus, that releases all those important things and getting you revved up at the same time releases cortisol. And cortisol is like a steroid that's really, really, has about 20 different bad side effects if you have it too, too high in your bloodstream. So it's not something that you want to have around all the time. And we know this is true because if you've ever heard of people having like post-traumatic stress disorder, that's exactly what's going on within. They're sort of in this chronic, revved up state all the time. It's really hard on your body. So you don't want to be in, in a fearful state all the time. You know, we're all wired differently. Um, you know, I've always been kind of interested in, um, in studying personality uh, traits. And some of you, if you've ever taken like personality tests, they'll have, um, you know, Maybe you're high on, on this particular trait, but you're low on that particular trait. And there's one that's called the big five. It's kind of like the well-accepted standard of, of looking at personality traits. And one of those traits has very much to do with your level of positive and negative emotion when it comes to things. Okay, and so 
So some people, you could consider this sort of being like that half glass empty, half glass full kind of people. You know, some people are really high in positive emotion and with an, any kind of new experience, they can tell you all the great cool things that are, oh boy, that could come out of this. And then you've got, you know, the other, the other half, the, maybe the, the, on, on the lower spent, uh, end of the spectrum, on the negative emotion standpoint that will tell you all the A, B, C, and X, Y, Z of, of bad things that could happen in this new scenario. And so what's, what's interesting about our personality traits is that they're kind of hardwired, meaning that, you know, if you're uh, high positive emotion, you're not really going to ever change from that. That's kind of how you are. And that's not, not something that you can change uh, mentally, um, kind of like more, any more than you can change your hair color. You know, I don't know what the point of this is other than I think that you should know yourself. Like some people are, some people are wired differently. I mean, I look at my, my wife and I are wired a little bit differently. I would consider her to be a little bit more risk averse. And I consider myself to be a little bit more risk tolerant. And that actually is a kind of the good yin and yang of our marriage. And so uh, she probably tends to keep me out of trouble. But I, uh, I yeah, maybe I can keep things a little bit more exciting. I don't know. But... Um, Point being is that we're all wired a little bit differently when it comes to fear. And isn't that such an interesting thing? Fear is a powerful motivator. I just have this picture of this kayaker being chased by a shark. It's like, yeah, that's going to motivate you pretty well. Uh, fear is really, really good at that. It, it causes you to, to definitely be prepared and avoid dangerous situations. I always remember, I think about this time, I was on a, a job interview uh, where I went down to Baltimore, and I'd never been there before. And so I flew into Baltimore, and I was by myself, and I was staying in a hotel downtown Baltimore. I didn't know much about it. Um, and so I decided, well, you know, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get something to eat, and I'm not going to eat at the hotel, I don't think. I'm just going to go walk up and down the streets till I find something that I want to eat. This was like pre-Google Maps and Yelp. So <laughs> I just started walking down the street in downtown Baltimore, and I made it a few blocks, and then all of a sudden, I had, like, the hair on the back of my neck stand up, and this idea that, you know, there were eyes on me, and this little voice that said, turn around and go back to the hotel. <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget, like, that. I, I don't know whether that really protected me. I really felt like something bad was about to happen. But anyway, the, the fear can really like, protect you. It keeps you out of dangerous situations. You know, you get, it tells you to keep your, get your act together, stay out of trouble, you know, keep your nose clean, that kind of thing. And, and to stick to, to the loved ones, to stick to your loved ones. I mean, no one wants to be alone. I mean, I, I, I think about, you know, for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years or so, um, as a deacon, I've been down to the, the Impact Church of Christ. And, and what we do down there is deliver uh, food and clothing and such to the, the homeless uh, gentlemen and, and, and women that are in need. And ha having gone down there every month for, for all these years, um, it's interesting to see a lot of the same faces the entire time. Well, that's a whole other discussion, but what, what I've thought a lot, of time, a lot about these guys and gals. It's like, why, why are they in the situation that they're in? Is there anything that they have in common? And I, I feel like the thing they have in common is that they've alienated their families. It's like, that's the final straw. It's like, that's your, that's your safety net. And so um, nobody, wants to be, nobody wants to be alone. And maybe uh, that's why we stick so close to our family is because we're afraid of being alone. Fear can really uh, paralyze you. Um, you know, if, if you have it for too long, like I said, it can be bad. And it's one of those things that uh, can keep you from engaging with the world. So when I was looking through the Bible, I was thinking, what's the first time that you encounter fear at all? Like the very, very first time. And so I, I went through and I was looking, and it didn't take me long to find it. And so that's, you know, Adam and Eve have just committed the first sin, <clears throat> and God is walking through the garden of eden and he's looking for adam and can't find him and adam's in the trees hiding in the woods and he says you know what are you doing in there and he says i was afraid because i was naked so i hid and it's like that's exactly right our first response to sin is fear and then from that disengage hiding in the trees no longer willing to engage with the world no longer willing to engage with god it's like yeah fear can paralyze you you know, I kind of feel like we're living in 2019, 2020 COVID era. I mean, are any of us ever going to forget this? Probably not. And probably be telling people for a very long time about these weird years. 
And so, you know, what is fear doing to us right now? Is there a lot of fear surrounding what we're going through right now? It's like, you better believe it. And every single one of you has not been quite sure what to do with the fear that you have. I mean, is it going to, are we using it to protect ourselves? Well, sure. I mean, of course you have. Of course you've maintained your distance and tried to, to avoid this potentially scary virus. And it's not potentially scary. It is scary. I mean, I, I can tell you from being in the biz, I've seen folks with it and I've, had friends with it that were really sick. It's nothing to, nothing to be um, flippant about. But at the same time, you know, how far are you going to take it? I mean, how far are you going uh, you to you hide in the corner? I mean, when are you going to start living your life? And I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you like I know the answer. It's tough, right? I mean, it's tough. You want to live life, but you don't want to be stuck in the corner. So <clears throat> fear can be kind of good and bad. And it can stall out your service. And so it's like, it's like teaching this class. I mean, there's a there's hundred reasons why I could say that I'm, I'm scared to do it, you know. But nevertheless, we're here. But it, fear can make you stall out and keep you from serving God when, when, when you most certainly could. Or serving in a worship service or participating in a ministry. I mean, I think about this brand new Faithful Fathers ministry. Like, like what, if, what if those guys were afraid that no one was going to think it was, you know, useful? Like, what, what if they were afraid? They wouldn't have done it. And so... Can't let fear stall out our service either. You know, I really love the stories in the Old Testament because it's so real. I mean, you oftentimes, you know, obviously the, the Bible's had its critics forever, and people have said, oh, well, it's just made up. And who was it? It was um, Karl Marx that said that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, correct? And you, the religion is there just to numb us. And it's like, well, if that was true, and if you were going to write the Bible, you certainly would probably whitewash it a little bit more than you have and make it a little bit more sometimes easy to believe, correct? I mean, you know, Abraham is a hundred-year-old father. I mean, <clears throat> that and a hundred other uh, particular things that you might just omit if you were writing the Bible and you wanted to make it easy for people to swallow, right? But it's not always like that. But I love it because it's so real. I mean, the, the people that, that God chooses... Um, yeah, they are 75-year-old guys that, that have been, you know, maybe they were living in a tent, and he says, okay, now get out of your tent and go to Egypt, okay? He says to them that, that despite not knowing where they're going, that Abraham did, did this. And imagine how scary that must have been to take your family and not know, even know where you're going and go to a foreign country. <clears throat> so, as well, you know, rescuing Lot. He had to defeat four king's armies to do that. That sounds pretty scary. Argued, bartered with God. I mean, does that sound like something that you'd be super excited to do and not the least bit scared of? Is arguing with God, you know, for a bunch of sinners? Or uh, being asked to sacrifice your own son? I mean, all of those things were certainly fearful situations that Abraham was right in the middle of and stood up and, and, and faced it and, and took the call. So Abraham's a great example of that. And what does he say? God says, don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your very, very great reward. Jonah, same thing. I mean, you know, uh, obviously afraid to do what God asked him to do and needed a little convincing. <laughs> and ultimately did what he was asked. And that, that's kind of what I like about these stories is that you think, well, these are all flawed characters. I mean, like deeply flawed characters, like, you know, liars and adulterers and murderers. Um, uh, d and at the beginning, maybe there are people you wouldn't be so excited about hanging out with, but it's like God kind of carves on them a little while and he, he etches on them a little while until the very end. There are people that you would count on and people that you would want to know. Moses, same thing, 80 years old, which is another interesting thing. That means that all of us, doesn't matter what your age is, needs to be ready for the call. Like, <laughs> we all have to be ready. We don't know when it's coming, and we have no excuse. Age is obviously not an excuse. So go now. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so was he a perfect man to lead Israel? I mean, he was, he was afraid that, you know, he, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't speak. He wasn't a speaker. He's like... He was afraid people were going to find out he was a fraud. You know. But his bravery ob yeah, obviously in inspired the Jews to follow him. Daniel, it was the decree by the king that you couldn't pray, that, that 
that the Israelites couldn't, that, that were there couldn't pray. But he did it anyway. He never gave up praying. He faced his fears. I mean, how, how fearful would being down in a lion's den be? I mean, I can't even imagine the kind of fear that that would give a human being. Talk about your eyes dilating. <clears throat> anyway, so his, his devotion to God inspires King Darius to, to issue the decree that, you know, as a result, all, that uh, the entire kingdom should revere the God of Daniel. Point is, is that they all struggled. And it's, it, even once they took the call, it wasn't like it was super easy for them. Pretty much some pretty scary, huge obstacles came across them immediately. I mean, what was it when Abraham went to Egypt? It was immediately like a, a, um, a famine. It's like there was hard stuff along the way every time. And they weren't perfect, but they got carved into these soldiers uh, that God could use for his purpose. And I think that's the coolest thing about them overcoming their fears is that God changed them. They were, they were, never, they were never the same. First Peter, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be ignored. I put this picture up here of soldiers because it reminds me of you guys. It really does. It's like, think of the people that you know in this congregation that are, that are soldiers, that are, that are battle-tested, that have, have seen fear and seen it through, that have, that have taken the call, that have been etched by God to do exactly what he's asked them to do, and that you could count on in a time of struggle, and that would fight for the faith, that won't let people water down the, the, what the Bible says. Like, that's, that's you guys, and that's what I think of you guys, is that you're soldiers, and, and, and you're fearless. I put this up there. Do you really know yourself? Um, I don't know how many of you have thought crazy thoughts like I do, but sometimes I sit and wonder who's really running the show up here. I mean, it's like how many times have you had just a weird thought come into your head and you're like, where did that come from? Like, what depth did that come from? That's not me. I mean, why did I think that thought? Maybe it's a good thought, maybe it's a bad thought, but where did it come from? Um, I believe it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that the line between good and evil runs through the core of every human heart. It's like we're all capable of such horrible atrocities and such wonderful, lovely things. And it's kind of up to you, but it's, it's, it's all in there. And can you control it? I mean, every single one of you has a nature. You have a nature about you. I mean, can I ask you to like things that you don't like? I mean, can I ask you to not like things that, that you do like? I mean, can you really control it that much? That's always been s sort of a scary thing to me. It's like I've always looked at myself, tried to look at myself as if I was somebody else viewing me. And I think, well, would I like that guy? Is he honest? You know, does he, does he really care? Does he, is he bogus or is he genuine? Um, and I, I wonder, you know, would I really like that guy? And it's kind of a scary thought because we just, you just don't know where everything comes from deep down inside. But at that same time, there's this beautiful notion that in the same way that I don't know what I'm capable of, there's, there's also amazing things that I could be capable of. If only I could let maybe God work on me for a while, like carve on me for a little bit. Could you control your fear even if you wanted to? I guess that's my point. You think you have that much control of what's going up here that you could control fear? Like I just told you, it's down at a cellular level. You think you can control it? You can negate it? Well, here's what the Bible says. It says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, underlying guard your hearts and minds, I sat and thought about that for a while because I almost think that I've already convinced you, maybe, that you can't negate your own fear and that it's deep down and it happens and you can't even control half your thoughts when they come through. How can you not be anxious about anything? Well, I think it's, it's not so much that. It's that if you do ask God, with request that he will guard your hearts and minds. It's almost like technically that. He'll technically do that. Like that in some way he'll, he'll protect your, your mind from, from those fears. 
I actually really think that. This uh, is a scary picture of a closet door. <laughs> I have a daughter uh, that's eight years old, and her name's Bridget. And every night when it's time for her to go to bed, you know, my wife or I, we take her up, and we take her up to her bed, and we tuck her in, and uh, tuck her in, and we, we, and we will pray to her, pray with her. And inevitably, if the closet door is open, she says, could you close that? That's like, you know, mostly I just close the door. But a couple of times I've been like, there's, there's nothing in there. It's like your dresses and toys. It's your stuff. Why are you afraid of what's in there? And then she says, can you still close the door? And so I close the door. Because, I, because what am I? I'm trying to be a loving father, and, and I want to take her fears away. And how easy is it for me to just close the door? It's like pretty easy. I just walk over there and poof, done. <clears throat> but sometimes I think, you know, to myself, little girl, why are you afraid of that? There's nothing there. That's so insignificant. That's not even a real fear. Don't you know what kind of fears I have? Don't you have any idea what the real fears are? And then I thought to myself, maybe that's exactly what God's saying. It's to me, he's like, hey, little guy, you know, those fears you have are just as insignificant, not more so. Don't you know where you're going? Like, those are nothing. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. The Lord your God goes with you. So again, can you... Can you will fear away? Can you make it just go away? Let me ask you this. Have you ever been afraid for your life? I mean, maybe this could be, maybe you're afraid. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe you were in a near-death experience. Maybe you were in a near-head-on collision. Maybe you were in a car wreck and survived it. Maybe you got some scary news and got a scary diagnosis. I've been there, and what I can tell you is that, and I'm sure many of you have as well, it's like you stop and think about the number of days that you have left. You think, well, I only have a certain number of days left, and I have no control over it. And not only that, not only do I not have the control over what days I have left, I, those, all those days behind me, I don't have any control over those either. It's almost like my days are numbered. We know that's the case, right? Our days are numbered. It's almost like the days have been allocated to me and that I've been constructed for some certain purpose within that particular time frame. And if that's the case, then what am I waiting for? Like, what am I afraid of? And that's actually what, what, what you think about when you're going through something that's, if, if you've ever been through anything quite like this, it's like, you know, what, what am I really afraid of at this point in time? It's like full force on now, guys, because there's nothing to be afraid of. I've already come to the realization that I'm not in control. And it goes back to that skateboarder. It's like you're, you're leaping in full force in midair. You're fully engaged. You got no safety net. Get out there and go after it. What could you possibly be afraid of? Put this picture up here because um, I've been thinking about this for a long time, is this idea that if I could somehow live my life such that I was looking through a lens, like maybe a really long lens, and, and what I was looking at was kind of where I'm going to end up at. Hopefully that's heaven with God. If, if that's where I can focus my attention on, then the, everything else around it seems blurry. It's almost like it doesn't matter. And life gets really, seems like it gets really simple when you look through that lens. Because it's like everything that encounters you on a day-to-day -day basis either helps you get towards your goal or pushes you away. And decisions start getting a little bit easier. And your fears start melting away. So I like that idea. That's all I have for today. Um, I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you so much.